is one of the most assessments you can do, especially on a mission to the hospital. One reason for this is it helps drive the patient's plan of care. So we wanna identify those injuries as soon as possible, or we wanna be able to identify the interventions we need to put into place, either to prevent a wound from getting worse or even a wound from possibly developing. It's also important to note that if a patient comes in with a pressure injury and we don't identify or doc document within the first 24 hours, this is now considered a hospital acquired pressure injury. What this means is the hospital is responsible for the injury. It does not matter how confident we are that the injury was not hospital acquired. If we don't document it, then we own it. So essentially we don't get reimbursed for the care of that injury. Um, so please make sure that we're finding and document injuries and wound within the first 24 hours. It's, a, it's extremely important. Um, so all patients on admissions should receive a thorough head to toe skin assessment this assessment should also be done with another clinician. Every patient on a mission transfer, which includes transfer from another unit or facility, is going to require a thorough assessment, which we call a four eyes assessment. So as I mentioned, we conduct a four eyes skin assessment or a thorough skin assessment on admissions and transfers. You should also be conducting regularly skin assessments on any patient that you have in your daily care. However, the 4 eye skin assessment is a process where two unit nurses or clinicians, which may be your PST, an MP, resident, or another attending physician, examine the entire skin of the patient for any abnormalities. This requires looking at and touching the skin from head to toe with a particular emphasis over those bony prominences um, of the patient. This assessment and documentation is completed again on patient admission or transfer from another unit or facility. So just to reiterate, on admission, you should complete a four eyes assessment as well as take photographs of those areas of bony prominence. On Wednesdays, we consider that wound Wednesday. So if your patient has known wounds, you're going to take pictures of those wounds so that way we can assess the development or regression of those wounds. And Photographs should be taken again at discharge, especially when sending to any extended care facility. Um, again, and this is to assess how well that wound uh, healed while they were with us or did they worsen and now they need to follow up with wound care. So this just helps us track that progress of the patient's wound. So in addition to the items that we've already discussed, it's important to note that you still have daily required charting regarding a patient's skin condition. So within our daily required charting, us as clinicians are required to document any abnormalities in a patient's skin within our EMR or we utilize EPIC. Within EPIC, you have two areas that you have the ability to document wounds or abnormalities within. These are the flow sheets or the LDA avatar. On the screen, you're gonna see a chart that's gonna help you differentiate when you should document in that integumentary flow sheet versus the LDA avatar. And this will be included in the pack, your packet handout on your folders as well. Any significant wound, surgical incision, pressure injury, wound vac, or discoloration on a bony prominence should be documented on the avatar. Anything non-essential that may be abnormal, such as very small generalized bruising, maybe from a long-term um, blood thinner the patient is on or even some scabbing should be documented in the flow sheet. So again, anything large and significant should be documented on the LDA and it should have some sort of media or image associated with it. So you, that way, as you continue on to report, it's easy to let your fellow RN know what that image is going to look like. So as I said, you have those two options within Epic of utilizing either the flow sheets or the avatar. On the pitch, on the screen right here, you're going to see the avatar. So if you're documenting a ulcer, a wound, or a pressure injury, you're going to utilize this avatar. You're going to search in the left-hand box for what you wish to document, and then you will select wherever on the avatar you would like to place that item. Once you have placed the item on the avatar's anatomy, it's then going to prompt you for when this was first assessed, so when this was first found, date and time, and it's so important to note, this is also gonna ask you if this was present on hospital admission. If this was present on hospital admission, please indicate yes. So that way, again, we're making sure that we're covering 
you and ourselves that this patient came in with these items or wounds, so that way we don't associate them as a hospital-acquired pressure injury or hospital-acquired wound. Once we have identified a wound and documented on it, the next thing that we need to do is order a wound consult. So I want to emphasize you do not need a physician's order for this. You are able to place this under your scope of practice. So appropriate reasons to order that wound consult will be any stage twos or greater, any hospital acquired pressure injury, um, moderate to severe moisture associated dermatitis, traumatic wounds, um, wound backs that are not being managed by other teams. So for example, if you're on a floor where a wound back was placed by the surgical team, that is not going to be managed by the wound care nurse that will be managed by the surgical team. Um, new ostomies or previous ostomies that are coming in with issues such as leaking um, or discoloration, things like that. So any new ostomies or ostomies coming in with new complications. On the screen, you're just going to see some common examples of why we would not consult our wound team. So for maybe a stage one, mild variation, um, so very small bruising or even moles. So if any of these non-essential items are noted, they do not require a wound care consult. Okay, we're just going to do a very quick review of the brain scale. I know many of you have probably reviewed this various times. So the Braden scale is the tool that we utilize within our facility and it is part of your required documentation that helps to identify if a patient is at high, low, moderate, or even severe risk of skin breakdown. Um, so this scale is driven by sensory perception, mobility, nutrition, moisture, friction and shear, and activity. Just take a couple seconds to look up on the screen to identify some of those definitions associated with the Braden scale and think about how you would address some of these areas. So for example, for mobility or activity, maybe we need to assess of how can we get that patient mobilized? What do we need either consulted? What do we need ordered? Or what equipment do we need to mobilize a patient? On the screen, you're just going to see a very simple example scale, the Braden scale, and how we score on a rating scale from one to four. So as we score our Bradens, if we have a patient with a score of 15 to 18, we know that they are at risk. So for these patients, the first thing that we should do is identify how can we mobilize them, get them active as much as possible and as safely as possible. So this means getting them up to the chair with a chair cushion, ensuring we have a PPOT consult, um, maybe taking them for a walk in the halls. We also want to protect and elevate their heels, uh, manage moisture, friction, and shear, so making sure that they're dry, and also giving them the education to let us know when they want to get up, when they want to get to the chair, when they want to go for a walk, or even when they may not be dry and need to be changed. For patients with a Braden score of 13 to 14, these are our moderate at-risk patients. So we should put in the same interventions we did for at-risk patients, but take it a step further. So this means making sure their bed's at a 30 degree angle, um, assessing if we need a turn schedule and utilizing foam wedges to turn these patients, um, elevate and protect the heels of these patients with blue heel protectors. If a patient is bed bound, utilizing a comfort glide underneath them, assessing which protective ointment is best for those patients, and using our foam dressings on any bony proneness, which is available in all of your combines. And for our patients with a brain scale of 12 or less, we need to follow all the same protocols we've already mentioned for our low and moderate risk patients, but we also need to address if a specialty mattress needs to be ordered. So a specialty mattress is considered a P500 or bariatric mattress, in the next following slides, we'll go a little bit deeper with those, but those need to be ordered. You can order those by letting your HUC know. They will call the Hill Round facility and get that bed ordered. You do not need a physician's order for this. You can order this bed for yourself. Um, in addition to a regular turning schedule, which should be called out during huddles, so all staff know this patient needs to be turned. Anytime you're in the room, make a small shift in that patient's position to help uh, reduce a patient staying in one position for too long, allowing for the development of injury. So for all the patients that we've mentioned, we talked a lot about how a wound consult would benefit these patients. So 
but we also need to think about whether a nutrition consult is needed. And this can be placed without a physician's order. And this is gonna have the dietitian help to assess the patient's nutritional intake. We know that patients that have wounds or at risk for wounds are going to need an adequate amount of protein and other substances to help prevent that breakdown. And we may need a social work consult to help assess the home situation or living situation of a patient who comes in with significant wounds or just to help provide family members and caregivers with resources as the patient gets closer to discharge. Um, and again, that could be placed without a physician's order. And lastly, maybe a PTOT consult. Now, this will require physician's approval. However, you can always ask the physician if they feel this or consult is appropriate. And this is going to help establish um, a safe mobility schedule for the patient. When we think about the resources for skin prevention or prevention of skin breakdown, I like to think of two mnemonics, um, no ulcers, which is going to stand for nutrition and fluid status, observation of skin, up and walking, lift, don't drag, clean skin and continence care, elevate the heels, risk assessment support, and skin, which is surface selection, keep turning, and continence management and nutrition. These are some really simple phrases that you should keep in mind as we talk about the different interventions and resources that we have. And think about your patients. We always want to provide individualized care. So utilize what you feel best is for that patient. So the first items we're going to talk about are the creams and pastes that we have available within our facility. The first two are the HydroGuard silicone cream and ZGuard paste. These are both plant-based. They're natural, free of sulfates and parabens or any added fragrances. When you have the blue cream, I want you to think of barrier. This is a silicone-based barrier. It's going to be breathable. It's less occlusive compared to the ZGuard paste desitin or triad, um, it's going to be considered our first line of defense. So this is really for our patients with very little to no breakdown. They might have some very light pink to red blanchable skin. So we should be using um, our blue silicone cream along with one of our foam dressings. The second cream that we have is the Z-Guard paste. Um, it's orange. I want you to think of open skin, um, or incontinence, it's going to contain a zinc oxide as an active ingredient. So remember, zinc can be drying. It really should only be placed on open or macerated skin um, or areas of excessive moisture that have associated dermatitis. Um, this is going to be very, very helpful for your incontinent patients. So if you have incontinent patients that are getting breakdown because of that incontinence, you're going to utilize this ZGAR paste. You are not going to use a foam dressing with them because that foam dressing is going to actually hold in that moisture. And the Z-Guard paste, if it's placed underneath the dressing, is actually going to kind of crumble and dry out. So it's best to use this paste without a dressing on top. And lastly, we have Triad, um, and this is going to be a hydrophilic wound dressing. So it's a zinc oxide-based paste that's going to naturally debris necrotic tissue. Indications for triad include open pressure ulcers, partial thickness wounds, full thickness wounds, and even first and second degree burns. Um, triad is an ideal alternative for those difficult to dress areas, such as those near the gluteal cleft or peri wound edges. Please know that triad cannot be placed on any wound that has suspicion of infection. If, if you find a wound and you have um, some sort of suspicion that this wound is infected, you're going to clean with wound cleanser and you're going to place a dressing for coverage and consult the wound care nurse. Um, triad can be changed every five to seven days. It does not need to be wiped off for removal, so please don't try to scrub that off the patient. Leave it on for that five to seven days. And again, for that triad paste, if you're putting that on any sort of open or pressure injury, you still need to consult that wound care nurse. She will come and assess what you have done for the patient and make changes if necessary, if they feel the triad is appropriate or if there's another item that might be more appropriate for the patient. So as I mentioned, we do have specialty beds that we can order. So to order these beds, again, you just Talk to your hawk. You let them know what room number and which bed that you want. Um, the three, the two that we utilize most often are going to be the Compella bariatric bed with low air mattress, as well as the VersaCare P500 mattress. So assess your patient, and if you feel that your patient would benefit from either one of these beds, let your hawk know. Um, again, you do not need a physician's order, so it's up to your discretion if you feel this would benefit your patient. 
So in addition to the specialty beds for patients, we also have the comfort glide that are gonna be helpful in preventing that friction and shear injury to a patient. So you have comfort glides in all of your units. Um, these should be placed underneath the patient. They have handles on each side to help with boosting, lifting, and turning. They also can be connected to a air pump that is located in each of your dirty equipment rooms. Um, this should be utilized with two RNs at all times, but it can be blown up to allow for easier boosting or turning. So please, especially for patients with Braden's 12 and less, this should be underneath them. You can put a pad on top to maintain a dry environment for the patient. You can have a sheet on top of it as well. Um, so please, utilize these again they're in all of your equipment rooms within the hospital we also have wedges and boots available in the hospital so you can see within the images on the screen that we have a patient with a comfort glide our foam wedges now there are two foam wedges in a package um, they are per patient so they're going to stay with that patient throughout their hospital stay you want to make sure that you position those wedges so that there's an area um, that's going to allow the sacrum to be free of any pressure. Um, and then we also have the boots on the screen as well. So those are going to be all available within your equipment rooms. And if you feel that your patient needs any of these items, please utilize them. Um, if any of these items are missing from your equipment room, please notify supply chain through the paging system. They're under 995050 or 995050 and let them know which item you need for your patient. The Medline Comfort Glide Lateral Transfer System has been designed to assist with the lateral transfer of patients to help reduce the risk of caregiver injuries, promote compliance with safe patient handling protocols, and provide patient comfort. The Comfort Glide Lateral Transfer System consists of three components the Comfort Glide Lateral Transfer Sheet, Air Blower, and Optional Dry Pad for Moisture Management. The system is fully breathable and is compatible with low air loss mattresses. This allows the sheet to remain underneath the patient at all times. When using the Comfort Glide lateral transfer system, always use at least two caregivers for patient movement. Determine how many additional individuals are needed to safely perform patient handling depending on assessment of patient's needs and the facility protocol. Never leave the patient unattended while on an inflated transfer sheet. Refer to facility protocol for patients with spinal injuries and other unique conditions. To perform a lateral transfer, lock the wheels of the patient's bed. Adjust the height of the bed to waist level. Ensure that the patient is centered on the Comfort Glide lateral transfer sheet. Align the receiving surface as close as possible to the patient's bed lock the wheels of the receiving surface. Make sure the receiving surface is slightly lower than the patient's bed, approximately one inch. Raise the outside bed rail on the receiving surface. With at least one caregiver on each side of the patient, turn the blower to the on position. Once inflated, the caregiver on the receiving side should gently pull the transfer sheet using the extended handles while the other nurse gently pushes the sheet. Use the handles to properly position the patient in the center of the receiving surface while the sheet is still inflated. Turn the air blower to the off position and remove the air hose from the sheet. As the air deflates from the sheet, smooth out any wrinkles. Separate the two surfaces and raise the bed rail. Lower the height of the bed to the lowest position possible. Adjust the head of the bed as indicated. The Comfort Glide lateral transfer sheet is designed to be single patient use, but can be wiped down and spot cleaned for use with the same patient if lightly soiled. If heavily soiled, the sheet should be thrown out and replaced. The Comfort Glide dry pad is single use only and should be changed when soiled. The Medline Comfort Glide lateral transfer system helps prevent caregiver injuries and promotes compliance with safe patient handling protocols by reducing the effort needed to move the patient. For more information about Comfort Glide, contact your local Medline representative. Wedges. These things, if you can't find these or they're not in your part, you can order them from PCS. So you want to take the one wedge, they uh, top and bottom. One's going to go up at the top, and then one's going to be at the bottom. You never want to um, put it on their sacrum, and you also never want to put it over a wound. 
So when you log roll the patient over, you put the wedge in place. They're designed with the skid protection on both sides to prevent it from moving. And then put the wedge at the other end. And leave them here, and then two hours later, you'll want to go to the other side and rotate them. So that is it on the comfort glide. Okay, so as far as the heel boot, um, the heel medics boot comes in a black bag like this. And then, do you want to hop up here? So you take it out of the bag, and what we recommend is you take the straps and pop them back like this so they don't get stuck on the Velcro as you're trying to put the boot on. And then you want to take the boot and turn it inside out. And then take the patient's foot, you want to make sure that their heel is in this hole. So when you flip it back around, their foot is uh, snugly fit in there. And then these two straps go directly across. You want to make sure that these straps are not rubbing against their leg. And then these straps are for foot drop protection. So this is going to help push the foot back and strap it along the edge to prevent the foot from dropping. And your patient. The last item that we're going to talk about is what to do when you discover a hospital acquired pressure injury. So when this type of injury is discovered, the first thing you should do is always assess your patient and assess what intervention needs to be in place? Is it a foam dressing? Is it a protective ointment? Um, it may be wedges or boots for the heels. Then assess the patient's consult and assess if the patient has a current wound nurse consult or if that consult needs to be placed by the RN. You're then going to alert clinical leadership. You can do this through Epic Haiku. Um, that's most preferable, attach the patient, let your manager, your clinical leader, you can put the wound care nurse any, um, on and just let them know what was discovered. Once that occurs, you're then going to make a nursing note and documentation of what was discovered, what interventions were put into place. Um, a super huddle is going to occur. This will occur with the wound care team and your clinical leadership team and it's going to just talk about what we could have done to help prevent this pressure injury and we'll also go through the documentation so for example if you have a patient that is refusing any sort of intervention it's so important that you place that within your nursing notes daily um, so when we go back and we try to assess what did we as a team need to improve upon that helps us identify if we were communicating these patients that may be refused turns were difficult to turn um, or there was some miscommunication in the care but this huddle is really to identify what did we do well what do we need to work on and what as a team can we do moving forward